two. We are now joined by Gary Paris, CBS Sports college basketball writer. Joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Gary, thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. What are your thoughts about how Baylor has opened up this year and and how they have replaced the studs they had that are some playing in the NBA or at least in the case of Mark Vidal in the NFL? Nobody is a bigger believer in that program and what Scott Drew has built than I am, or at least um, I, I put myself as, as anybody's equal. Um, but I mean, even I am blown away by what they've done and, and what they're doing. I mean, the idea that you could lose four starters from a national championship team, including two NBA guards, and be in a lot of ways just as overwhelming as you were last season, um, without enrolling, like, you know, the number one recruiting class in America with three lottery picks or something like that, is, is, is fairly unprecedented if not entirely unprecedented in college basketball. I mean, you are operating largely with a new cast of characters in new roles, and they look like legitimate national title contenders again. You know, as always, we'll see. It's a single elimination tournament at the at the end of this thing. It can always go a variety of ways. Sometimes one seed blues in the first round. But if you were putting together a short list of, of national championship contenders together right now, Baylor would have to be on everybody's list. And you know, to be clear, I thought coming into this season that Baylor would be good again. I didn't know that Baylor would be this again, but but they're they're clearly special once again. Gary, what do you what are your thoughts on on the freshman Kendall Brown and and Jeremy Sohan, who have both uh, contributed a, a great deal early in the season? Well, I mean, if you look up and down that roster. I mean, when you lose the guys they lost, you knew that the newcomers were going to have to play significant roles. And the guys who were returning, whether it's Adam Flagner or Matthew Meyer, they were going to have to, to take jumps. And basically, across the board, everybody has done that. I mean, you look at some programs and there's a disappointing player here or a disappointing player there or there's somebody you thought was going to be able to take a big leap this season and it just hasn't happened. And at Baylor... Um, it is operating the way it's supposed to operate with, um, you know, the newcomers having real impact and the returning players uh, properly elevating themselves into bigger roles. And obviously the, the big name among the newcomers, at least among the newcoming freshmen, is, as you mentioned, um, Kendall Brown, who um, is, is long been considered, at least for a while, been considered a, a, a great prospect. But I tell you, you never know if great prospects are also going to be great players. Like Amani Bates at Memphis is a great prospect. He's not a great player. In fact, he's not very good at all right now. Um, great prospects aren't, aren't always great players, especially early in their freshman season. And yet Kendall has been uh, terrific. Everybody, you know, sees the highlights, and, and, and those are the things that go viral. But in addition to that, he's just a he's a high-level basketball player who is capable of, of being a, um, a real contributor, top-shelf player for a national championship contender. And, and, you know, there's only a handful of freshmen who are capable of doing that right now. Gary, Iowa State uh, has gotten off to an unbeaten start, had a couple of top 25 wins about a month ago, now find themselves uh, right there in the top 10. What do you make of the Cyclones? Obviously surprised, but when you take a closer look at it, uh, maybe we shouldn't be as surprised as we are, and I include myself in that. Because um, the thing everybody focused on was Iowa State won two games last season and fired their coach, hired a new one. And those types of things typically take a minute to rebuild if they get rebuilt at all. Unless it's a situation like John Calipari taking over Kentucky and immediately enrolling John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins, and Eric Bledsoe. You know, outside of that, when you take over such a terrible situation at the power conference level, it's going to take you a few years to get it back, even if, you know, that's if you get it back at all. But there's an obvious thing that, that changed and an obvious thing that, that made what T.J. Otzelberger is doing at Iowa State possible, and that's the one-time transfer waiver. You know, if you go look at Iowa State's um, you know, roster right now, I believe this was true. I know it was true as of a few days ago. Perhaps it changed, but either way, the point is, is the same. Their top six scores, five of them are, are transfers who are eligible immediately. 
You know, they got a transfer from Penn State. They got a transfer from UNLV. Um, they got a transfer from Kansas. And then they added a top 50 freshman, and that's their team. And so this isn't, um, you know, the, the team that you watched go to and whatever they went last season, but only won two games. Like that, those players and that coaching staff have literally nothing to do with what is happening right now at Iowa State. It, it, and this is an example of a coach um, using the transfer portal to remake a roster um, in his first season, you know, within months of getting the job. And now we are headed for what appears to be an incredible scene on New Year's Day because, barring a surprise, it'll be 12 and 0 Baylor against 12-0 and Ohio State inside a, a sold-out Hilton Coliseum. And, you know, I, I know New Year's Day is, is typically reserved for college football, and I know that those games will be the things that draw the biggest audiences, but uh, we got a, an incredible college basketball game on tap um, for the first day of 2022 as well. As if the Big 12 needed yet somebody else to join the elite, or at least in that conversation, which Iowa State has been in the past, but – the, the last year or two, as you know, last year was just a bad year for them. What are your thoughts about all of a sudden we're seeing Memphis and Tennessee, Louisville and Kentucky, among other games, canceled? Are we about to see a stretch here where we don't know who's going to play? Yes. I mean, uh, you know, we're getting a new cancellation every hour or so. And most of the situations are um, just a byproduct of, of what we're dealing with in our country. This Omicron variant, um, doesn't appear to be as devastating uh, from a sickness perspective as other variants, uh, most notably the Delta variant. But all of the data suggests that it's incredibly contagious. Um, you, you probably won't get as sick as you might have otherwise gotten, especially if you're vaccinated and boosted, but it won't stop you from testing positive. And so what we're seeing all over the country now, in most cases, is, you know, these players are under very strict instructions right now at most college basketball programs. If your throat hurts, let somebody know. If you're coughing, let somebody know. If you have a fever, let somebody know. Because the last thing we want is you linger around the team and causing an outbreak within the team. And so a player will go and say, hey, I'm not feeling too well. You test him. He's positive. Um, even though he's vaccinated, he's positive. And in some cases, that can trigger another round of testing and another round of testing. And what we're finding out, whether it's in the NBA or in college basketball, um, e, when you test, you are often going to find positive cases. And when you have too many of them, um, your team can't function. You don't have enough players to play. That's what just happened at Ohio State. My understanding is that is what it happened. That's what happened at Louisville, at UCLA. The Memphis deal is a little different. Because Penny Hardaway acknowledged yesterday for the first time that more than half of his team is unvaccinated, which is in embarrassing for a, 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 a leader of student athletes to put his team in this position. Because what happens um, for unvaccinated players is that you know they can't test out of a situation. Like at Ohio State, if you are vaccinated, even if three of your teammates test positive. If you're vaccinated and asymptomatic, you're good to go. You can play a game tomorrow. But the way the protocols work, at least in the American Athletic Conference and in most other places, um, unvaccinated players are immediately wiped out by contact tracing. So at Memphis, what happened? On Saturday morning, they had two players test positive. And immediately the medical professionals come in and they say every unvaccinated member of Memphis' team is out for seven to ten days. Well, now you don't, you, you know, you don't have any players. Penny Hardaway said they had four players eligible to play in Saturday's game against Tennessee, so they obviously couldn't. So to answer your question, the teams that are mostly vaccinated or entirely vaccinated, they are going to have a better shot to get through this than than unvaccinated teams. But basically everybody is at risk right now of, of having to postpone or cancel games because this variant is, is running wild in our country. Craig asked you about Iowa State and, and their, you know, revelation on the scene so far this season. What do you think about the rest of the Big 12? Kansas, Texas, uh, and, and their staying power. Kansas has had a couple of scares, and of course the, the one crazy loss to Dayton, but they, they look to be a deep team. Texas has all the transfers, but maybe hasn't come together yet. Yeah, like Kansas I'm not worried about. Um, in fact, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by what I've seen. Ochai Abaji looks like he's taking a real jump. 
Um, you mentioned North of Dayton, you know, that comes on a buzzer beater, high bounce off the rim shot that fell through. If that ball falls another direction, Kansas is um, maybe ranked number one in the country right now and undefeated. So regardless of what number you see besides KU's name, um, that, that's a legitimate Final Four slash national title contender. I'm a little less certain of what Texas is. Um, you know, Chris Beard is an, an obviously great coach, and he enrolled um, a lot of, you know, statistically good players, um, you know, via the transfer portal. But uh, you know, one thing multiple coaches pointed out to me in the offseason as the conversation turned to Texas was, yeah, this player is good. Like Marcus Carr is really talented, but he's never won. And, uh, you know, uh, this other player they enrolled is really talented, but he never won anything at his old school. So, like, you bring in a bunch of people who have, you know, yeah, average double digits in points, but for losing teams basically everywhere, what does that really amount to? And through the first five, six weeks of the season, um, it looks like the people who were skeptical that Texas was going to be a real challenger to to Baylor and Kansas at the top of the Big 12 um, were probably closer to right than wrong. Um, you know, still early. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to give it time to, to see where it goes from here. But Texas doesn't look uh, doesn't look great so far this season. I think Texas Tech is good. I think West Virginia is good. I think Iowa State is legitimately good, and so. You know, the Big 12 often rates as, as the best conference in the country. And I think at this moment, you could reasonably uh, call it exactly that. Gary, thanks for your time. We appreciate it very much. Gary Paris, CBS Sports, college basketball writer with us on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. I got one note, by the way, on Baylor basketball. I saw this uh, today from Jared Burson. They are the first defending national champion to win each of their first 10 games of the season by eight or more since UNLV in 90 and 91. Baylor has played 40 games since the start of last year and won 35 of them by eight points or more. Yeah, David Kay, uh, who is like the main uh, SID over at uh, Baylor basketball, 14-2 uh, and two now all-time as the number one ranked team in the country. Uh, 36 straight weeks in the top 10, 34 straight non-con wins, 19 straight home wins, 18 straight non-con away uh, wins, and nine straight neutral site wins. So they're on an absolute tear right now. There's no doubt about it. It's a pretty special run, and uh, everything's coming up, you know, Baylor men's basketball. So uh, enjoy it while you can because uh, it, it's got staying power, obviously. But, uh, man, it, it's it's hard to get this good. I and, mean, it really is. And, and I believe of that, enjoy it. of that 14 and 2, one of those is the first one was the first game. They were number one. Yeah. They were number one, and then they went up to – I think they went to Manhattan and lost – uh, right away. Uh, or so West Virginia. West Virginia. Virginia. Like they West Virginia, West Virginia. Yeah, yeah. West Virginia. So that was the first time they'd ever been number one, and they lost right away. And then so then after that one time, they're thirteen and one or fourteen and one since then. So uh, they they know how to stick there. Yeah. Uh, one other note, um, Brian Bell. Uh, I'm not seeing any confirmation or anything or any like obviously Baylor's not putting anything out, but uh, based on just reading the tea leaves and what a couple people have said. It looks like it'd be an analyst, which would make sense. Uh, yeah. Starting off as an analyst, he's not going to 